pulled pork finishes up a scan of a floating piece of concrete and rebar, then turns toward them. I'm looking for my guardian, he chirps. That's nice. You gonna find him in that rock? You never know, Miss Ninkechi32. Maybe my guardian is very small. Maybe, Ninkechi agrees. But you might want to consider scanning the dead, bud. That shell's pretty snappy, is it new? It's reef purple with a flower-like silhouette and silver detailing. Well, with that in mind, let's check back on him in a couple of months. Who knows, maybe he'll get lucky and find the greatest guardian of all time. Welcome back guardians. This is part two of my 50 mysteries of destiny. In 2016, I posed 50 questions, 50 unanswered questions about destiny. Turns out heaps of them have been answered in the law. And so this is part two of that. I'm going to cover the next 10 questions. If you want to see part one, I'll put it into a playlist on my homepage. Thanks for supporting this series. It does take a long time to put these videos together. It's like 10 mini law episodes in one. So I appreciate the support, but that is not the reason why I've got the face cam on today. We have some really exciting news. As many of you know, I co-host the Destiny Down Under podcast, which is an all Australian Destiny podcast. And we've been working with Bungie to give the Australian community a really awesome experience at PAX in Melbourne this October. Oh, <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> so two things are going to be happening um, at PAX in Australia this October. First, Bungie is flying down uh, Moila, the voice actor for Eris Morn. They're also bringing over a developer. So Bungie is really showing their support for the Australian community and they're going to feature on a panel at PAX on Friday the 11th of October at 4 p.m. The panel has been hosted by the Periodic Table of Awesome and we're also the Destiny Down Under podcast. We're going to help host that panel and it'll be your chance to hear from Eris Morn which would be cool coming up to Shadowkeep and also a Bungie dev as well. So really cool opportunity for the Australian community. If you are thinking about joining PAX, this is the one to go to, but that is not it. Bungie's also helping us, the Destiny Down Under podcast, put on a community event. <laughs> this is going to be big. I'm a little bit scared of how big this could be, but they're going to help us host a community event. It's going to be within walking distance of PAX. It'll be at 6 p.m. on the Friday night until whenever we stop. <laughs> but what I need you to do, if you're going to PAX and you want to come to this event hosted uh, by the Destiny Down Under podcast and supported by Bungie, I do need you to register. So I'll put a link to register for the event uh, in the description below. Please click on that link as soon as you can, really. We need to start knowing numbers and we'll let you know venue details very shortly. But this is going to be a really cool PAX for the Australian community. We've been speaking to Bungie. They really want to support, nourish, and grow the Aussie Destiny community. So I hope you can join us. And we can have a really good turnout and a really fun time at PAX. I'm excited. Everyone's... <laughs> can't even talk. Whatever. All right. That's that done. Um, you know... The artwork at the beginning of this video was created by Gamma Trap. You know the deal. I pay him through Patreon. Any Patreon donations go towards me paying pay, paying Gamma Trap for the artwork. If you're interested in that, please see the link below for the Patreon details. This is Mylan Games, and I hope you enjoy this latest Destiny 2 lore episode. Continuing the countdown. Question number 11, where is Lysander? As far as I am aware, we have not had any new information regarding Lysander. Lysander was the leader of the Concordat, who tried to overthrow the Vanguard, however they were stopped by another faction known as New Monarchy at Bannerfall, a tower along the wall. The Bannerfall Grimoire card reads, Lysander and the Concordat mark the most recent example of a city political factions rising in opposition to the consensus. This site marks a legendary battle where New Monarchy's guardians rose to deliver the final blow to the Concordat, unraveling the war effort Lysander sought to bring against the Vanguard. The Concordat were then exiled from the tower and dismantled. The Ghost Fragment City Age Grimoire card reads, And so it is agreed. The Concordat shall no longer be recognized among the consensus. We'll begin the dismantling right away. 
but what of those guardians who have pledged to them? We can't afford any more banishments. I'm sure Zavala can see to their realignment. We'll do our best. Lysander chose his followers wisely. It may take some time. Lysander will not back down. He'll continue his crusade from wherever we stuff him. And so we'll need to find some new ideas to replace his. The last we heard of Lysander was when we received the sparrow, Lysander's cry, as a gift during Destiny 1 Rise of Iron. The implication of this gift is that Lysander is still trying to bribe and recruit followers. According to Ikora Ray's secret agents, The Hidden, Lysander is still plotting his return. The Lysander's cry, Grimoire card reads. According to The Hidden, in the wilderness beyond the city, Lysander rallies his supporters and plots his return. Some whisper of sympathizers in the tower and hidden gifts for guardians who honor him. Moving on, question number 12. Where does Ephrodite go? The pacifist settlement location. We got a lot of information about Ephrodite as an Iron Lord during the Dark Age when Destiny 2 Forsaken was released. For example, this much loved entry when Ephrodite throws Saladin like a javelin. The Mark of Remembrance lore entry reads, He stops speaking as Ephrodite grabs him by the metallic collar, pressing him over her head. Arc energy from both light bearers coalesces in a roaring storm around them. Saladin's crackling, barely contained, Ephrodite's flowing, guiding. The mountain rumbles beneath her as she steps forward. Waves of gravel and dirt blast up behind her as she hurls the armored man off the cliffside like a javelin. The combined arc energy singing like a drawn sword. Saladin's gilded form becomes a cannon shot, tearing holes through three layers of clouds as he rips down toward the fallen walker. Whilst we get some amazing lore like that, as for the location of the pacifist colony that Ephrodite visits, we still don't know. The Lady Ephrodite Grimoire card reads, The Vanguard are also intrigued by Ephrodite's accounts of a non-military guardian community in the Deep System, but Ephrodite, though happy to talk about the group's pacifist philosophies, refuses to disclose the settlement's location at present. In addition, in-game, the pacifist community is said to be in the Outer Rim. Whilst we have not seen Ephrodite as a vendor since Destiny 1, apparently she returned during the Red War in secret and witnessed the Traveler's reawakening, and according to her, she's coming home. The Cosmos Shell Law entry reads, The old doubts came back when the light went out, but the iron in her bones, worn and rusted as it was, never buckled. The light was gone, but holding a sniper rifle still felt right. She marched into the city beneath a refugee's hood, took up a roost in the building with a white rabbit, and killed 216 cabal with 199 bullets. She cried when the traveller woke before her eyes. At her hip, a radio blinked to life. It had gone quiet when the Red Legion attacked. She answered it with trembling fingers. I know, she said. I can see it. I can feel it. Even the stars are brighter now, said the voice over the radio. The whole cosmos is ablaze. She closed her eyes. I can't wait to see it. I'm coming home. Ephrodite out. So, he's hoping that Ephrodite will return at some point and she will reveal some more information about the colony of guardian pacifists. Moving on, this is a big one. Question number 13, where is Savathun? Yes, three years ago we asked this question. We asked where Savathun went after leaving Oryx in the Books of Sorrow, and we are getting pretty close to now discovering what Savathun has been up to. This question first started with Savathun leaving her siblings, Oryx and Zaphir Arath. Verse 5.4, the gift mast from the Books of Sorrow reads, Then saith Savathun, Siblings, listen, we must part ways a while, so that we may grow different. She flies her war moons into the black hole. Her throne becomes distant. We would later discover that Savathun was already trying to manipulate the Hive tribute system. The Hive tribute system is used to feed their ever-hungry worms. The underlings take the energy from killing and pass it to their superiors in some sort of horror version of a pyramid scheme. Savathun has been trying to escape slash manipulate the tribute system since the Books of Sorrow. The injection lore entry reads, But Savathun, desiring neither a chain nor a pull, set about devising a secret way to feed the worms of her broods. Thus, she would escape the trap. 
In her modest cunning, which she prefers not to be overstated so as to preserve her from the scorn of gossips, she gathered several of her ascendants, who were in danger of being consumed by their worms. Then she pushed them through a rapture into close orbit of a black hole. Deep in gravity's embrace, time passed slowly for them. See how their worms are satisfied, Savathun said, for their hunger grows sluggishly, but their servants continued to dispatch tribute at the ordinary rate. But the worms sensed the deception and increased their demands. Thus the orbiting sacrifices were consumed and their remnants fell into the event horizon from which not even the hive might return. So despite her attempts to fool the worm gods, it failed, the worms just increased the amount of tribute that they required. Her most recent attempt to manipulate the tribute system was to feed the worms not off violence but using trickery or cunning. Savathun planned that any time someone failed to understand her, this would count as tribute. The thank you law entry reads, Now I have tried to put an ascendant in orbit of a black hole while its spawn gathered the tribute of an eon, but the worm is not satisfied, for it sees the trick. What I must do is amplify the speed at which tribute is gathered. A pocket world where time passes quickly would do well, or a world where time is a torus and infinite violence might be gathered. With such a murder battery, I could become a being of supreme insight. The thrall indicated it was confused, but not lost. With this tribute, I shall undertake a mighty work, a real humdinger of a scheme. I'm going to refinance my entire existence. I'm going to move from an existential economy based on the accumulation of violence to an existential economy based on the accumulation of secrets. And the tribute of failing to understand me, I shall name this tribute of failing to understand Imbaru, for it shall be as formless as the mist. After Guardians defeated Oryx and his throne was left vacant, Savathun looked to claim the throne and control the Taken. Tolan says in-game that the Vex mind Coria is how Savathun is controlling the Taken. Tolan says this, Coria is the key, the mind simulates Oryx and thereby masters the power to take, but of course Coria is no power until itself. With this ability to control the Taken, Savathun also gains control over Riven, the Ahamkara. The boots of the Great Hunt reads, I did not notice her. That means the Light did not notice her. She knows that though I am Taken, I am beholden to no one. So I ask her if she wishes to take up those strings. She does, and I take a new shape. My cage loses its purpose. I can tell this is not part of her grand design. This is an introduction. She is at play. Through our new bond, I glimpse her intention, and I hope she remains at play. Most of those who bargain with me do not win. She releases vibrant, unrestrained bursts of air from her face. I do not. Guardians who then fight and defeat Riven fuel the last wish, which was to enact the Dreaming City curse, where Dal Inkaru, Savathun's daughter, gained access to the Shattered Throne. We are now stuck in a time loop of having to constantly defeat Dal Inkaru, and at this stage, the Dreaming City Curse is still not resolved. Perhaps a clue to Savathun's location or future plans is when Lavinia travelled to the Nine's realm. Lavinia was a training cryptarch obsessed with discovering the Nine, and when she went through a portal to the Nine's realm, she encountered a witch. The witch lore entry reads, some place where you're appreciated, where we can really use everything you've learned. The old lady pours a thin stream of tea into a cup of bone. Didn't I tell you that you were lucky back when you were born? The reason why this is important is because Sabathun's daughter, Dal Inkaru, also has a bone tea set. The thank you law entry reads, Dal Inkaru serves you poison in a fine tea set of Amkara bone. Does this mean Savathun is exploring, or at least has access, to the Nine's realm? Lastly, Savathun also wanted to control and spy upon the Cabal. Savathun enchanted a crown, known as a Crown of Sorrow, with the hope that anyone who would wear the crown would come under her control. Callus obviously saw this trick and had Galran wear the crown, 
only to invite Guardians to defeat the Hive Cabal in the Crown of Sorrow raid. While we have had lots of lore about Savathun, we still have not encountered the Hive Queen herself, fingers crossed for Shadowkeep. Moving on to question 14, where is Zyphu Arath? Similar to Savathun, many people are interested in knowing what happened to the other sibling, Zyphu Arath. However, unlike Savathun, Zyphu Arath has had very little information added since the Books of Sorrow. As far as I am aware, we have only seen the addition of named enemies in Destiny 2 Forsaken, such as the Spawn of Zyphu Arath, Venom of Zyphu Arath, Ferocity of Zyphu Arath, and Will of Zyphu Arath. But, as far as I know, no new lore. Moving along, question 15, where is Taox? Now, I partially covered this point in part 1 of this video. Taox was the one to portray Oryx and his siblings, who originally were part of the Osmian throne. So, for many, Taox is the Osmian traitor. In the strike mission Savathun Song, we actually see a named enemy called Osmian traitor. This could be Taox, this could mean that Savathun revived or recovered Taox, or it could mean nothing. Alternatively, maybe Taox is still out there, and once again has reverted to some sort of cryostasis to remain alive. Verse 3.5 from the Books of Sorrow demonstrates Taox's ability to stay alive for long periods of time. It reads, Mercenary Explorers, Disposable Class, discovered an organism frozen in stasis deep within the hull. She claims to be Taox, member of a protohive species. During debriefing, she provided records of the fall of the Ammonite civilization and vital intelligence about the motives, biology, and leadership of the hive. Moving along, another massive question. Question 16, where are the nine located exactly? This is a tough topic, but we definitely have a lot of information to try and understand what the nine are and where the nine are. That being said, like much of the law, it is up to your interpretation. My interpretation is this, the Nine sound like these ancient godlike beings from the dawn of time. They are everything and they are nothing. They are gods observing the universe, yet they cannot interact with the universe, or they have limited interaction with the universe. They witness the development of civilization, and they almost want to relinquish their godhood to be more like mortals, to think, to feel, to see, to hear. They want to be part of our material, chemical universe. A training cryptarch known as Lavinia accessed this realm of the Nine by passing through a portal. The gate law entry reads, Lavinia reads this again, horrified and fascinated. Something on the far side of the gate is learning to assemble atoms, molecules, even haphazard life. Something from a world of darkness and dust, probing its way into our structured existence, trying to cobble together a message, an emissary, a body. The Nine are on the far side of this gate. She's sure of it. She's found them. Then we get what is likely the best description of the Nine. The Nine law entry reads, Lavinia Garcia Am Tawul comprehends the Nine. They were already ancient when the first human beings named themselves. Their flesh was older than stars. The dark dust wind that blows through the galaxy, pinched by the gravity of Sol and its planets, drawn into their cores and exhaled again. These were the Nine. But life arose on the worlds at the heart of the Nine. Tiny complicated motions of ecosystems, and metabolisms, and computations. That life left mass shadows in the wind of the Nine, plucking at them like harp strings. From these trembles of structure, the Nine learned to seed enormous resonating waves, thoughts vaster than worlds. They had no eyes to catch light, they had no ears to hear, and yet they turned their wills upon the alien world of matter, and strove to learn, for they knew they had to protect their hearts, or die. With a horror of revelation so absolute that it would drive her mad if she still had sanity to lose, Lavinia understands where the Nine have always been. They are within everyone, every system, every living, and every moving thing. Trillions and pentillions of slim, dark matter tentacles plunge through all our bodies, drinking up the complexity of our lives and thoughts. We are all pinched silhouettes impaled on the twitchlings of infinitely long spider legs. 
Personally, I would like to read over all the nine lore again and even get some different opinions from you guys. But at the moment, I would say the nine live in this God observation realm, separate but also connected to our universe. The witch lore entry explains how the nine want the light to free themselves from their realm. It reads, Came now the traveller, and with it a strange hope, for the traveller's light had the power to cause without causation. If the nine had the light, they could seed their own minds, free themselves from the dependence on matter life. They could gain forces beyond gravity to structure themselves, and so become more than wraiths of dark dust. They could enter the mad alien superworld of our chemical reality. I don't think we'll get much more lore on the Nine. I'm sure they will return eventually in the future, but considering how much lore has already been dedicated to explaining the Nine, I don't expect we'll get any more answers anytime soon. Moving on, question number 17. Where is Toland? The Grimoire card that started this mystery is perhaps my favourite lore entry in all of Destiny. In the Ghost Fragment, the Hellmouth Grimoire card, Tolan reveals that he met the Death Singer, which killed him. However, somehow he survived in some different state. The Grimoire card reads, I too am detached from my source. The charming Iyurt made her introductions, and I was very pleased to meet her. We had a conversation, a little tete yurt, a couple old wizards exchanging definitions. I defined myself a friend, she defined for me the quiddity of death, and she sang the song of that fearful autonomy. Revelation, my friends, it goes down hard. The definition killed me, the killing redefined me. With the release of Taken King and the introduction of the Dreadnought, many speculated the white orb upon the Dreadnought was Toland, but it was not until Forsaken was released that the white orb spoke to us and the dialogue icon on the screen revealed that the white orb was in fact Toland. So yes, Toland did enter the Hive Netherworld after learning about the Death Singer's song in the Hive Hellmouth, and he continues to guide us through the Hive Ascendant Plane. Moving on, question number 18, where is Osiris? This is a bit of a sore point for me. When Curse of Osiris was released, it was a low point for the Destiny community, and quite a tough time for law content creators because they had removed the Grimoire cards by this point. Consequently, Osiris doesn't have a huge amount of lore, and the lore that did come with Curse of Osiris was, in my opinion, not that interesting, considering the potential of Osiris. I think the most important lore about Osiris comes from the webcomic. Osiris is in fierce conversation with the speaker, and the comic book reads, Osiris, they're already able to simulate citizens. I believe they intend to begin simulating guardians. Tell me, speaker, what happens when they simulate someone from the larger structure down to the smallest particle? Speaker, rubbish. It's impossible. It, Osiris, I'll tell you what happens. They'll produce perfectly simulated guardians that they can kill and resurrect a million times until they know the real deal better than we know ourselves. They'll simulate the traveler's light and they'll use that to kill us all. So, Osiris is very concerned with the Vex's ability to simulate the light. We of course see Saint 14 killed by such a simulation, as the Vex created a machine to specifically simulate the light of Saint 14. Following this argument with the speaker, Osiris would leave slash be exiled from the tower. With the Curse of Osiris DLC, we will discover Osiris in the Infinite Forest, researching and battling the Vex. Without covering the whole of Curse of Osiris campaign, this is about all that happens. We defeat the Curse of Osiris campaign, and Osiris returns to the Infinite Forest. I think most would agree, now that Bungie has hit their stride with the lore books, it would be awesome to receive some more lore on Osiris. Moving on, question number 19, where is Saint 14? Now I briefly covered this in part 1, where I tried to answer the question, is Saint 14 really the speaker's son? Now firstly, I have an update on this mystery, I actually missed a paragraph from the webcomic which pretty much confirms Saint 14 as not really being the speaker's son. The webcomic says, don't tell me you still believe in the speaker enough to call him father. So there you have it, Saint 14 is not really the speaker's son, just a loyal follower. Now like I said in part 1, we discovered Saint 14's body within the Vex simulation. 
they made a specific Vex mind with the sole function of draining Saint-14's light. Lastly, but definitely not least, question number 20, where is Prince Aldrin? We have so much lore on Prince Aldrin with the release of Destiny 2 Forsaken, but let's start from the beginning. Following the Awoken battle with Oryx, Prince Aldrin escaped the chaos and crash-landed on Mars. The aftermath Grimoire card reads, the Techians should have known what the Dreadnought could do. Must have known. Did they not feel what he felt? Hear what he heard? And that damn catch, it wasn't protected. They had to know that. All to deploy the Harbingers. They barely got a foothold before the weapon was fired. He thought of Petra and how overwhelmed she must be. Forced to hold her post and watch her people perish. He tried to calm himself again, forcing long breaths. He realized where he was, Mars, at the Basca, the Candor Isles. He hadn't been here in so long, not since he found the Black Garden. The countdown to the shield's deactivation pulsed. He tried again to home in on her, to find if she truly gave herself for this battle. He felt close to something, a hum of starlight, then shield deactivation broke his focus. Prince Aldrin would then planet hop to get the attention of the House of Kings. He was intentionally caught by the Kings so that he would be brought before the Kell of Kings, and then he could kill the Kell. The Ghost Fragment the Reef 4, Grimoire card reads, He let his captors drag him through the dirt. His arms ached, two hands wrapped around each bicep like iron bands. He slumped, and the toes of his scuffed boots bumped over the stones and left trails in the dust. He kept his eyes low, a ragged and stained cloak hanging over his face. It was not a position to which he was accustomed. They debased him, they abused him, he bit the inside of his cheek until blood filled his mouth. He struggled not to resist. They needed to believe he was broken, that he wasn't a threat. Following this, we don't quite know when Aldrin was infected by the darkness, which could have occurred during the battle with Oryx, However, now Aldrin is obsessed with finding his sister, Marasov, and his corruption is represented by black clouds in his eyes. Aldrin would then resurrect Fickrell, who would become the leader of the fallen Scorn, who are fueled by ether tainted by the darkness. Aldrin is then captured and thrown into the prison of elders with the other Scorn, only to escape with a prison break led by Fickrell. The prison break obviously results in Cade Six's death. Aldrin then resumes his search for his sister Marasov, haunted by hallucinations of her. It is revealed that his hallucinations were caused by Riven, who was trying to escape the Dreaming City and required both light and the darkness to open the gateway. After opening the gateway, Aldrin is consumed by the voice of Riven, who was then destroyed by Guardians. Aldrin then returns without the darkness, only to be killed by our Guardian slash Pet Revenge. Finally, Aldrin is revived as a Guardian himself by the ghost Pulled Pork. And as of writing this video, Guardian Aldrin has not been seen in-game apart from the one cutscene. Wowza. It is really cool to see how much this game has developed in story over the last three years. There has been lots of bumps in the road, but we are in a great place at the moment. Once again, I apologize for having a cold. It is so hard to record videos with a blocked nose. This has been a long script to record, so a like would be extremely appreciated. And if you cannot think of a comment, you can leave the words pulled pork to represent gold, goldrins, <laughs> to, re <laughs> to represent guardian aldrins, who I've just given a new name, goldrin, to represent goldrins' new ghost, pulled pork. Uh, as usual, it's been a pleasure. This is Marlin Games. Peace.